Three, two, one, rolling. Welcome back. We made it. We made it to week two. Week one was scary. Thank you to everybody that watched the video. That was dope. I didn't think anybody was going to see it. I didn't really promote it out, but I started refreshing my YouTube. I started getting a couple notifications, and I realized that somebody must have seen seen it because I had more views than I thought it would and that somebody happened to be my mom she shared it with all of the uh the, the pickleball squad in in Greenville so shout out to my mom shout out to everybody from the pickleball courts that tuned in and watched and yes I appreciate it it means a lot so week two I'm going to be more organized and I'm going to have a little bit of a show outline so I'm going to start starting off with one random thought uh, that happened to me or run one random thought that I've had like during the week that I think is funny or just random. And then we're going to do a just a quick Australian Open update with maybe sometimes maybe just one storyline or overall just what's going on in the tournament, like an overview of that. So my random thought for the week is actually happened this morning and it's I learned this is one of the scariest places that we can go to in this place it's in a large usually a larger room maybe a couple hundred other people in this room and it's pretty full but there's one spot that's not full and I think one of the most intimidating places that we can go as humans is the front pew in church. It doesn't matter what church you're at. It doesn't matter what, maybe it doesn't matter. I feel like at the uh, at the black churches, everybody's all in, which, you know, we need more of that. But the front pew of a church is always empty. And it doesn't matter if church is slammed. Actually, it's not empty. There's usually like one elderly woman, like a grandma, most times with maybe a hat that's sitting on the aisle of the front row. And, the, you know, the preacher or priest will always be, hey, we got some seats in the front if anybody wants to, uh, if anybody's looking for a seat. People would rather stand for an hour, an hour and a half, than go sit in the front row at church. So that's my uh, random thought of the week. The front pew of church is the scariest place. Maybe it's scariest because that's, I don't know why it's the scariest, honestly. It should be the most safe, but that's my random thought of the week. Now, the Australian Open. The storyline I want to hit on is the Cordas, the Corda family. Peter Corda, Jessica Corda, Jessica Corda, Nelly Corda, Sebastian Corda. Sebastian Corda is our proud American tennis player. He is 20. Let me look it up for you real quick. 22 years old, born in 2000. But he's in the quarterfinals. Last round, he beat Medvedev, who other than Djokovic, probably was like a higher favorite to win the tournament. And then he just beat Herbert Herkaz, or however you say his name. But the Corda family has to be, is arguably the most athletic family in the U.S. Now, Peter, the dad, is not, I mean, when he was playing, he wasn't American. He played under, who did he play under? Like Czech, I think. He's like a Czech tennis player. Yeah, Czech. He's Australian Open winner. But Jessica Corda, one of the top golfers uh, in the game. Nelly Corda is the top golfer in the game. And she's, you know, doing all the matches with Tiger Woods and Jordan Spieth and everybody just like raves about her swing. And she's she hangs around at the top. They've Jessica, I believe, has been in number one golf ranking, too. But Nelly is the past two years, I think, is just always like staying in that top 10, was number one for a while last season, and everybody raves about her. But you got the dad who's a Grand Slam champion, Jessica, who's a stud, has won a bunch of tournaments, top, has been top 10, Nelly, top five golfer, and Sebastian, top, you know, their rankings always fluctuate, but we'll call him a top 30, top 40 tennis player. All in one family, all kind of similar in age just because the oldest I mean it's unreal like I don't know the only other families you could think of is maybe like the Curry's Steph Curry Seth Curry 
Dell Curry, the Jones, John Jones, Chandler Jones, Arthur Jones. But I don't think any of those people are like top, top how the Cordas are. So they need some more respect in the American media. More people need to know who the Cordas are. And that's why I'm here to let you guys know about the true athletes in this country that the, the ESPN doesn't want to talk about. So shout out to you, Sebi. Sebastian was at uh, IMG when I worked at IMG. Super nice kid. Dad is, Peter is kind of intimidating a little bit, you know, but in a good way. Uh, but Sebastian's the man. Now, episode two of Breakpoint. Episode two was my favorite episode uh, thus far. Of the two episodes, of episodes one and two, episode two, I liked more. And they get into uh, Berrettini, and oh my gosh, I literally practiced this 30 times before I came in here. Isla, I always want to say, I don't even want to say, Isla Tomlanovich. She says she's Australian. I don't know if I'm buying it. Last name doesn't sound Australian. We don't have an Australian accent. So Isla, we need some answers. Where are you really from? But this was a cool one. Because Berrettini, you see him, and the first your first impression of him is extremely good looking guy. He is a uh he's an Italian god, for lack of a better term. But this was cool because Isla and Matteo are dating. And she says they met. He slid into her DMs. And she said it wasn't love at first sight, but I mean, come on, look at the guy. I love, I'm in your shoes. I'm probably falling in love at the at first sight. But it's cool. We get to see you. There's a little, a love interest enters the, uh, enters the documentary. And so the background on Berrettini is he's the world number seven right now. He, I believe he made it to the final of Wimbledon and that's where he lost um, to Djokovic. If it was the semifinal, my apologies. But Berrettini, one of the top guys in the world. And then Isla is like a top 50 type player. And it's crazy to see the differences just in their lives. But we'll go into Mateo a little bit first. I mean, the first thing that stands out about him is when they go to his family in Italy, his granddad. I mean, you can't, you can't draw up a better granddad than, I don't even know the, you know, the Italian name for grandpas, but Matteo Berrettini's granddad is a legend and the grandma is brings in all the energy and so that was it was cool to see them and you could tell they don't really uh he didn't grow up super rich which is always fun to see i mean him and Kyrgios, you know the two people that they've dove into the most now didn't come from wealth which is really cool also this episode i'm gonna try not to uh touch my nose as much i noticed that when i was watching the last one but back to uh Bertini. Yeah, his family, he doesn't come from the rich background, so playing tennis is an expensive sport. These guys are traveling since the time they're 12, if they're good, at uh, at tennis. But Bertini says he wasn't really that good, and you see the footage of him when he's in high school, and he's exactly who he says he is. He's a, a long, lanky, kind of awkward-moving teenager, and his parents had to question him, like, hey, you know, you sure you want to – you sure you want to do this tennis thing? Uh, I can only imagine them sitting there watching him play, thinking in their head, oh, please don't commit to this because you're not that good. You you just look weird walking around out there. But he wanted it, and he grew into the body, and then that mindset that he had from a young age of just wanting to do it, that carried over because they – uh. You know, he they dive a little bit into his loss to Djokovic and Wimbledon and how that kind of like tested him mentally. And you see that when they highlight his first match, not the first match of a tournament, but the first match we see footage of is him versus Carlos Alcaraz. And Carlos is pretty much like the next Nadal. He's from Spain. He's a young, he's 19. He made a run in the U.S. Open last year and he's he's different. You know, it's it's weird for Matteo Berrettini and the guys that are his age, like in in the 27, 27 ish age range, because Nadal is getting older, Djokovic is older, Federer is gone, and I mean Nadal is still around and still winning, so it's tough. But you have way more of a chance now than you did before, 
And those guys are in the peak athleticism at that 27 to 28 age range. And Carlos Holgaroon is another guy, but Carlos is the young gun who looks like he could just dominate, start dominating the game. So those dudes sandwiched in the middle, you have to be panicking a little bit. Like, man, if I'm going to win a, a major, it has to be in these next three years. So we got this kid Alcaraz who is ruining everything for us. And he didn't have to deal with playing against Djokovic and Federer and Murray and all of that. And Murray making a little, or he made a little run too. He beat Murray, beat Andy Murray, beat Berrettini first round of the Australian Open. Insane match. Definitely match that would test the mental. But he gets into it with Alcaraz. And Berrettini is, he's awesome to listen to talk about his mental throughout a game. And, you know, he's up 2-0 on Alcaraz, two sets to zero. He's feeling awesome. And this is when you get that look into Alcaraz where never once does he ever look frustrated with himself or look defeated or anything. He comes back and that belief shows. And, you know, Bertini goes from up 2-0, oh, I'm good. I'm cruising into the quarterfinals or semifinals. Sorry, cruising through the quarterfinals into the semifinals. And... Alcaraz flips that switch and they start getting behind Alcaraz, which is another crazy thing about tennis is the crowd is so wishy-washy and flip-flop. I wish that I could be like that. It needs to be acceptable for us to be like that about some of our favorite pro teams. We should be able to switch in bandwagon when, when somebody else is doing well. But the crowd goes, switches to Alcaraz, all the pressure starts hitting and Berrettini has a dope quote um, where he talks about the balance of the balance of fear and will is key for him. And he's saying if there is no fear, there's no will. And he believes his will is a weapon for him. It's one of his top weapons. He has he likes his forehand and his serve and his mental. And it shows and he's like the more the he started playing with the more fear it started to elevate his game. And he so he, well, he drops the two sets. They're in the tie break. Tie break is first to 10 points. And he says, like, this is, my fear is at his peak, and that's when I operate at the highest level. And then he ends up winning, winning the match. Shout out to a couple things. He hits, he hits a flex. Y'all see that? He hits a flex. Mateo's in the gym a little bit. That thing was, that bicep was popping. So, get Jack 2023. I guess that was 2022, but Berrettini, shout out to your biceps. The second shout out goes to Vamos. It's so much cooler. Whenever somebody says, Vamos, I feel like it's so much cooler than, let's go. And, you know, I'm not Spanish, but I have started saying, Vamos, whether I'm playing tennis against my girlfriend and losing. Usually, and I get, you know, that one good shot. But if something small happens, drain the uh, trash into the paper. Vamo, vamo. Vamo is cool. Imagine if LeBron hits a three, turns to the crowd. Vamo. That's free, LeBron. The next one, I'm going to charge you. But that was cool. Like, you can tell he is an elite, elite mental thinker. And his belief in his self-belief is awesome. And it helps when you got the people behind you that believe in you. Again, shout out to the grandpa. He FaceTimes his granddad after he beats Alcaraz. His grandma calls him and, you know, she's excited doing the whole grandma thing. And then the dad gets on the, the phone and in Italian. He's, we beat his ass. Which you can't draw up a better response from a granddad. And in the tennis industry, it's just hilarious. Because I feel like that would be so frowned upon and, you know, grandparents just don't care. So that was cool. But another interesting part that they get to dive into is Isla was also playing. And in her match, she's playing Paola Bado Badosa, who also gets featured in the, in the show in later episodes. But Paola is a beast. She comes on the screen and just hits a few words and you're like, Oh my gosh, she's like I'm, uh, I'm addicted. Tennis is an addicting game. It's addicting to win tournaments. It's addicting to this, and you can tell she's just about it. But 
Isla is like top 50. Chris Everett is one of her main coaches. She goes out there and they do a great job of showing the the belief in pre-match. Like, okay, you know, I know I can play with the best. And then Badosa just punches her in her mouth with it. And Isla goes through and talks about how you just are she's just mentally breaking down out there. She feels like a light a lightweight playing against a heavyweight and you know, Bedosa looks like she's just a strong, strongly built Spaniard with the intense look. Like as she's she's like the whole package and you just hear Isla like going through it and she gets waxed and post match she's sitting there with her coach and it's just like oh, I just can't imagine. They're sitting there in the hallway and let me see here. I thought I wrote more down. Come on, JP. Oh, yeah. So she gets waxed and talks about all the doubt creeping on you. She feels like she's drowning on the court. She's embarrassed. And she questions why she's even why she's even out there. Almost like, why am I even going to play? This is stupid. And then the next scene, they're up in uh, their room. Baratini and Isla are in their room feasting on that room service. So, you know, a little food makes you feel better. But her and Mateo just kind of talk through. He tries to lend uh, some advice to her. And she commends him. You're more mentally strong than me and all of that. But then quickly, you know, they she has to start thinking about what's next for her. And it sucks losing that first match because that's the difference in a lot of money. And an example from this year is Michael Moe, who's an American, he lost in the qualifiers. He was in his hotel room. So, you know, qualifiers, I think in the Grand Slam, you make like 25 grand or something. Maybe 25 grand, could be less, could be a little bit more. But loses that in the hotel, about to pack up. Gets a phone call. Somebody got injured. Hey, Michael, you're playing in two hours round one Australian Open. And Michael's like, all right, like, let's rock. Gets there, warms up for 15 minutes, wins round one. Winning round one, he has now made $100,000, I think. It could be 80. Uh, Let me look it up real fast. Oh, yeah, look at this. Look at us. Technology, baby. Ignore the amount of tabs I have open. 2023 confirmed. Okay, yeah, Jesus. Okay, so he lost the qualifiers. And y'all see this here. I mean, this is insane. So maybe he made it to the third round, but he lost. So he got 36K. Round one, 106. So now he's made $106,000 just from getting into, just from winning round one. Round two, he's playing Zverev. Zverev is... All he's has been battling some injuries, but one of the top guys. Remember, Michael is a qualifier, no rank. Beats Zverev, like world, you know, top twenty guy. Now he's in round three, two hundred twenty-seven thousand dollars. This guy went from thirty-six grand to two hundred twenty-seven. Tennis players, you know, you travel all the travel. You have to pay your coach. You have to pay your physio. You have to pay your agent. You have to do all of these things. Hotel rooms, because a lot of these guys aren't uh, sponsored. And just from winning that first round, you can probably cover a lot of your, at least travel expenses, uh, just off that one, one W. And on the flip side, in Isla's case, Michael ends up making 225 k and is just a dog. Great dude. Also known from IMG. I'll bring him on here. He'll for sure, he'll give a dope interview and talk about that. But Isla, Mateo's asking her what's next. She's like, ah, I guess I could play in Charleston. Charleston, South Carolina. And then Madrid after that. First off, how does that even make sense if you're scheduling the tennis stuff? Like, you'll fly from Australia to Charleston and then to Madrid. It's insane. And so it's, but it just shows how important it is to <coughs> win that first round. I mean, it's different in seventy thousand dollars. Another funny, funny part with her, and then I'll go into the the next part of Mateo was he just beat Alcaraz. She lost, and they're 
uh, hanging out in the room after after the uh, Alcaraz match, and she's like, "What time do you have to be up tomorrow?" And or she says, "What time are you hitting tomorrow?" He says, ah, "I think I'm hitting around one." She's like, "Okay." You could see her a little bit, like she knows she's about to say something that might make him mad. And she said, "Okay, well, I have to be up at a uh, seven seven fifteen. He like turns around. He's like seven fifteen. She's like, "Yeah, I have to do a tennis channel thing, and it'll just take like ten minutes." And he's like, "Well, you cannot do that here. I have to sleep." She's like, it's 10 minutes. Like, where else am I supposed to go? He's like, no, 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 no. We're not doing this. Like, I'm still in the Australian Open. I I know they had to edit something out because, or when the cameras were off, I bet she chewed him out. Oh, I know she was hot when he said that. Oh, I I I feel for my man in the conversation that he had to have after that with her. But low key, he is right. And she did go do the uh, interview in the business center, but it was funny. And then she's like trying to pack up to go, to go back to you know to travel. She's having to step on her bag, and I can just imagine nineteen to twenty six year old kids like trying to pack bags for that long, and how often they have to do it. She's standing on top of a suitcase trying to press it down and get it zipped up, and there's still clothes everywhere, and it's. Hilarious. I would be late to so many things if I had to do all of that crap. And I can only imagine what it's like when they're leaving these tournaments. But then, so then they go to the semifinals. Last time he was in the Grand Slam final was obviously the Djokovic thing that we talked about earlier. Now he's one win away from getting back into a Grand Slam final. But of course, he has to play Nadal. And... Nadal is one of the obviously one of the most feared opponents on the tour, even with his age. And it's super cool because when people talk about Nadal and they actually have Federer's coach on who also coached Pete Sampras and now he coaches Taylor Fritz, but they had him on and he's singing all the praises of Nadal. And he actually calls Nadal the greatest competitor that any sport has ever seen. So I, I, I would agree I think there's definitely arguable, but leave it in the comments who you think is the greatest competitor of all time in any sport. Because I think that would be interesting. Interesting to see. And nobody ever talks about Nadal's skill set, really. You never hear players, oh, his forehand is just some unbeatable. His backhand is, yeah, there's no chance against it. His serve is awesome. The first thing any player ever says is it's basically impossible to break him and even if you're down even if you're up 2-0 you still feel like oh he's he's about to come back it's his his self-belief is just at the the highest level and I think that that is what separates the elite players from everyone else and the all-time greats from everyone else and even the top 10 from the top two is that belief and you know, that's a, it's a hard thing to replicate, especially on the tennis court when it's you versus you out there. And the doll just has that. He's just rock solid upstairs, and it has to be so tough to play against and know that's on the other side of the court. There's pretty much nothing you can do to break him, and he always thinks that he can grind you out and grind it, grind out a W. But the doll goes up quick on Berrettini. He's winning 2-0. And Berrettini is awesome with how he talks about his his mindset and how he's feeling. He just felt too, almost too happy to be there, too grateful to be in the position. And he says he's not feeling enough, enough fear, and there needs to be more pressure. And he's he's feeling embarrassed that he's getting whooped, and he wants to be scared. And then that third set starts, and he kind he kind of locks in, and it's really cool to hear him talk about how he's feeling as he's locked in and getting locked in and he says that he just feels like there's it's it's peaceful out there and he feels like nobody's watching and it's basically him him versus him obviously Nadal is a tough opponent on the other side but when he's in that zone he truly feels like he says he gets to know himself the best in those moments and I mean, I think that is so true for just so many things because 
It's your most feared moment, your biggest moment, the most pressure's on you. And he craves it because that's where he learns about himself. And that's how it is in life. I know I just kind of repeat myself there and didn't get to my point, but that's how it is in life. Like the anytime we're in a fearful, uncomfortable, high pressure situation, even if it doesn't go our way, we still like come out the other side of it having learned so much and it does make us better. Whether you lose, you know that you one, you know that you can get through it. Two, you can see what you need to work on. And then if you win, your 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 self belief is through the roof because wow, like I just I just got through what was one of the toughest things that I've been through and I came out stronger on the stronger on the other side and that carries on into your later matches, your later struggles in life, whatever it is. And you know, it's just important to seek those fearful and pressure filled situations because ultimately we all get better from those things and that's why Berrettini is a top 10 player is he welcomes he welcomes that challenge he welcomes the pressure and not everybody is is built like that and uh it sucks though because he has all those feelings but who's on the other side of the net Rafael Nadal who's the master of all of those things and Berrettini wins the third set fourth set Nadal's not having it and ultimately Nadal wins but I think the coolest thing uh, with Berrettini is after the match, he's obviously sad and defeated, but he talks about how he just can't wait to to get back out there. He takes those few days, soaks a little bit, but there's something inside of him that just it itches. It itches him, and I got to get back out on the court. I know I can beat these guys. I know I can continue to get better, and I'm going to get better, and I'm going to, I'm going to win a Grand Slam, and – to kind of build off of that when he talks about his motivation he talks about in the match he's feeling embarrassed mainly for his family and uh the things that motivate him is not everybody that said like he couldn't do it and when you hear him talk about his youth it seems like there probably was a decent amount of people that thought he couldn't do it coaches agents whoever he was a tall skinny lanky kid but his parents were all in on it and uh, he just wants to prove those people right. It's all about proving the people that believed in him right and not about proving the people that didn't believe in him wrong. And I think that mindset is lasts so much longer. That type of motivation lasts so much longer than trying to prove people wrong because it's coming from a more genuine place and it's for your family. And I don't know, it's really cool. And I mean, after watching the after watching this episode i you can't help but want Barry Tini to win and you respect his work ethic you respect his mental you love his family you love the granddad he's a legend and i i hope he can get that get one slam or just at least some big some big tournaments big tournament wins cuz he deserves it and he's a fun one and Isla, it was she was awesome to watch too. Their back and forth is hilarious. She's in like the next episode a little bit when they're going through Taylor Fritz and Maria Sakari and uh, I think they go into Paula a little bit too. It seems like Isla's always around. Everybody likes her. So she seems like a cool person to be around and yeah, overall that was a that was a solid episode and you just get to learn so much about the mindset of the game and I don't know. It was my, like I said in the beginning, it was my favorite, favorite one so far. So that pretty much does it. Full transparency. These last set six minutes that you just listened to, I had to redo because as I was talking in the first, my first take, I'm a one take guy. So I think that's important for you guys to know. But I'm a one take guy, and I, in the last eight minutes of the previous one that I tried to record, I knocked out this cord and didn't notice. So there's no audio on the last eight minutes. So I just had to try to recreate the last eight minutes. Maybe you noticed, maybe you didn't. Just know that I had some banger lines in that one that the audio got cut out of that I'm super disappointed about. But you learn from it. We move on. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Keep tuning into the Australian Open. 
tell your friends about some of these players that you like, that you're following along. So that way we can keep stacking the popularity of tennis, keep stacking the popularity of these players. And ultimately we will be able to bring back, bring tennis back to where it was when it was the top premier sport that everybody followed and everybody kept up with. So thank you guys for watching. Like the video, subscribe to the video, leave a comment <coughs> underneath the video. And if you're ever recording a video, make sure your mic is always plugged in. Thanks for watching. See you guys next week.